The Medellin cartel was a huge criminal empire that literally changed the rules of the game in the underground business and became synonymous with the cocaine trade for years to come. Pablo Escobar, Carlos Leda, Jose Rodriguez Gacha and the Oshoa brothers organized it all. About Pablo on our channel, we have already released an almost two hour video with a detailed analysis of his fate which you can find at the link in the description. And in this video, we want to focus more on the remaining leaders of the Medellin cartel and tell you more about how the entire organization worked, not just Escobar. So if you're interested in hearing how a gang of small-time smugglers managed to become the richest criminals of their generation, then meet the Medellin cartel on the other side of the law. Carlos Leda is the only Medellin leader to write a book about that period of his life. Yes, and all his activities are covered, not counting Escobar of course. George Young also talked about him starting with his book and ending with numerous interviews, and he was in the press with enviable regularity. Young, if anyone doesn't know, is the guy who was in the movie with Johnny Depp. We have a separate video about him on our channel, but it's not about him, it's about Leda. Carlos Enrique Lida Rivas was born September 7, 1949 in Armenia, the capital of the Quindío region in Colombia, to a father who was a German engineer and a Colombian mother. His father, Klaus Wilhelm Lida, arrived in Colombia in 1927 from Germany. He was an engineer for a German company that designed and built infrastructure projects and in particular was responsible for the construction of the railroad that connected Pereira and Manizales as well as the latter city's train station where Lida's mother, Helena Rivas, a former beauty queen and the daughter of a jeweler was from. There, they met, married and after a short time had four children. After starting a family, Lida Sr. lived permanently in Colombia, renamed himself to Guillermo and came home only occasionally to visit relatives. Because of his father's nickname, Carlos' childhood name was Aleman, which means German. The family lived well, they had a small business for the production and import of valuable oils and elite wines, as well as a small hotel called the German Guesthouse, which was constantly monitored by the authorities because of the mass gathering of German citizens. The hotel was popular, local officials often stayed there, but it never went beyond surveillance. According to rumors, Carlos Leda's father was a convinced Hitlerist and anti-Zionist and his house under the stairs was an altar to the Führer. According to Carlos himself, from childhood he was the lazy sheep in the family. His parents tried to give their children the best education, but their youngest son stubbornly resisted and in fact his education ended in the sixth grade of school. In 1959, Helena Rivas filed for divorce from her husband, whom she accused of outrageous treatment. He, for his part, responded with a similar suit in which the cause of divorce was adultery by his wife. In 1961, the Supreme Court granted the suit and divided the property and children between the former spouses. The older children remained with their father in Colombia, while Carlos and his younger brother went with their mother to the United States, settling in New York. There, when Carlos grew up, he hung around the Jackson Heights neighborhood in Queens because there were a lot of Colombians there, and after a couple of years, while washing dishes in a diner, he met chauffeurs from California who worked in the car rental business. They always came in nice new cars, and one day later, heard that these men were selling a brand new car for $300. He asked them why it was so cheap, and they told him that they could drive it for a month or two, and then they had to sell it. Carlos immediately realized that the car had been stolen from the agency where the drivers worked and as he says, the moment I decided to accept this tempting offer marked a turning point in my life. This decision ultimately determined my destiny in this world. It was my debut in crime. He was 18 years old at the time. He ended up selling that first car for parts for a little more than what he bought it for, but now later had the idea of stealing and reselling cars himself. He came up with the following method. In the state of Vermont, which borders Canada, to obtain license plates and registration of the car required only a bill of sale from a car dealership and proof of residency in the state. Later, rushed to Vermont, where he settled in the hostel of the Christian Benevolent Association, got a certificate of residency, 
then in the Bronx got copies of the original invoice from the car dealership and safely registered his first stolen car, taking it to Chicago, where he sold it for $1,800 in a Mexican neighborhood. The buyer hinted to later that he could get more of these nice cars and business picked up. Carlos' next step in the business was to meet Colombians working in parking lots whom he recruited as accomplices. While an American bigwig left his cool new car in the parking lot, they made a copy of the keys and at night stole the car. Carlos himself called it a complete course in car theft. The valet service cost $300 a car. Then he expanded the business and transported cars legalized in Vermont to Medellin. The historical moment of Carlos Leda's acquaintance with drug trafficking took place in his native Armenia, where he was offered to drive his own truck to Bolivia to buy a batch of cocaine paste called Pasuco. The journey was long and difficult. Moreover, he and his buddies were delayed in Bolivia for a month and a half because the distributor decided to send not paste but ready-made cocaine hydrochloride and it was their largest shipment at that time as much as 42 kilograms. Leda received a kilogram of cocaine for his part in the deal which was safely stolen from him at the port of Gaveston, Texas and according to his recollection, he thought, I'd rather steal cars than ship coke. At least there's someone to blame for the theft. However, he would once again go to Bolivia to get the shipment after which, as a US resident, he would be offered to participate in a marijuana deal. It consisted of Carlos renting a truck in the US and arriving at the appointed place to load an aircraft engine with 300 kilograms of pressed marijuana across the border. But DEA agents were already waiting for him at the location, so Carlos ended up in the Dade County Jail where he was charged with conspiracy to import marijuana and then transferred to a maximum security federal prison in Danbury, Connecticut. In that state, he was also facing federal charges of conspiracy and participating in auto theft. Because of his young age, he was 19, he could get as little as two years if he pleaded guilty. Carlos pleaded guilty and served 18 months until he was deported to his historic homeland. In prison, Lido wasted no time. He played sports, read a lot, finally finished high school and enrolled in intensive English courses where his boss was his cellmate, George Young. As Carlos himself recalls, Young was convinced that his profession was dealing pot and he offered later to participate, but Carlos refused, saying that after the damn engine story, he would never get involved with pot again. Lita told Young about the cocaine a little later when the puzzle came together in his head. Those shipments he was bringing from Bolivia were a gimmick. Back then, in the early 70s, it was an unpopular commodity. However, Young told stories about how hard it was to get coke in the United States. People seemed happy to try it, but coke was scarce and what was available was of poor quality. After a while, groups of Colombian mules began arriving in Danbury in masses and got caught at the border transporting small quantities of cocaine in everything they could find. Double bottom suitcases, children's toys, boot heels and so on. There were even invalids among them, trying to get through customs with a bundle in a prosthetic limb or cane for the blind. All the mules told with glee that there were new gangs of drug traffickers exporting cocaine. They were sending with each one a kilo, two kilos at most, but there was enough work for everyone. So Carlos told Young, George, in seven months I'll be back in Colombia and we'll be rich. In prison, Leda read many books, but one struck his fancy. It was an old book about the opium wars that took place between 1839 and 1842 in Hong Kong. It recounted the adventures of British smugglers who smuggled opium from India using the pirate island of Hong Kong from where Chinese captains on dozens of fast junks carried the opium to the mainland. This is how Carlos himself describes this epiphany. I extrapolated this story into my own plans. I wanted to bring cocaine to the coast of the United States and this book gave me the idea to set up a hidden base of operations near American beaches. I wanted to base my island of Hong Kong not on opium but on South American cocaine. Once out of prison, the 21-year-old leader, along with Young, set about putting their plans into action. You can hear more about their adventures and the formation of the transportation business in the video about Young. By the way, Leda had his own point of view on what happened between him and Young. 
He claims that George, with his inarticulate behavior, gradually got everyone himself and interfered with the business so much that his main distributor, Richard Burrill, whose contact Young did not want to share with Carlos, himself expressed a desire to go to the Colombians. Soon, the first big money appeared and later began laundering operations, creating a car sales company, Lida Auto, in Medellin in the upscale El Poblado neighborhood near the San Diego shopping center. It was at this office that he was introduced indirectly to Pablo Escobar. His cousin, Gustavo Gaviria, purchased a couple of luxurious Porsches through Leda's dealership. Rumors of two hustlers who could move the goods to the US began to spread throughout Colombia, where many realized the potential of cocaine. Laboratories sprang up, farmers began growing coca and basics of producing base cocaine. This is how Leda met El Mexicano Jose Rodriguez Gacha, an enterprising owner of several plantations and laboratories back in Boyacá. Around this time, in 1977, one of Leda's pilots told him about Norman Kay's Island in the Bahamas. Several houses were for sale there and the island was perfect for the role of Pirate Hong Kong. It was only 40 kilometers from Nassau and 140 kilometers from Miami. It had a wide paved airstrip and absolutely no power because the island was listed as private. Leda bought out a local hotel and the friendly old men who owned the hotel on Norman's Cay didn't yet know where this was going. Carlos quickly developed a warm relationship with the local Minister of Agriculture during his visit to the island, donating a weighty envelope to his election campaign and began to take over the territory. More and more airplanes came to the island, more and more Colombians employed in construction and home maintenance. Within a year, Leda occupied 70% of the land on Norman's Cay and closed the hotel to stop the flow of tourists. The owners of the yacht club and dive center were almost politely asked not to come anymore. But the island, as it later turned out, was home to more than just upstanding citizens. A couple years before Alaman, the island had been favored by Ed Ward, a small-time pot smuggler. Ward quickly realized who had taken over the island and came to talk to Leda. Carlos was in desperate need of experienced pilots and Ed, after some hesitation, began transporting cocaine with his crew. A little later, the right-hand man of the Prime Minister of the Bahamas paid Leda a visit. During his visit, he was convinced that he was a serious businessman because he immediately received a new BMW as a gift and, according to Carlos, they agreed on a $150,000 a month as payment for the lease of the island and guarantees of safety. Modern beacons and radars were installed on the island, the landing strip was upgraded and state-of-the-art airplane hangars were put in. The perimeter was surrounded by a grid under electricity and towers with turrets. There is also a legend that all the locals were killed, but this is probably fiction. Only one of the stubborn locals was found dead on the boat, the rest were quite happy with large sums of money for the forced relocation and in general, as the owner of the diving center who came to the opening of the season said later, when he saw the tower with a gun, he did not want to argue with the new owner of the island. Carlos later imported the vicious Dobermans and sheepdogs from Germany that became Norman Kay's trademark. The dogs, along with heavily armed guards, patrolled the perimeter of the island around the clock. The guards were trained by a good friend of Leder's named Yair Klein, a retired Israeli army officer. It was Klein who would in the future train Median cartel operatives to fight radical leftists and politicians. There was also a house for girls on the island, just as there would soon be at Escobar's estate. The scale of the parties on the island was simply staggering. All witnesses agreed that it was a true Sodom and Gomorrah on a single Bahamas island, which simultaneously housed a bunch of hardened smugglers armed to the teeth, along with tons of purest cocaine. On Norman's Cay, Leda founded International Dutch Resources LTD as a front for his real business, renting hangars and selling fuel to business partners who were shipping cocaine and marijuana to the United States. For $10,000, he rented small, modern airplanes to transport drugs and hired pilots himself. About 150 people, both Colombians and locals, serviced the island. It was 1977. In that year, Griselda Blanco, who had initially supported Pablo Escobar, 
was starting a war for leadership in the Miami cocaine market and Pablo himself, Rodriguez Gacha and the Oshoa clan had already organized what would later be called the Medellin cartel and which Carlos leader would soon organically join as a transporter. None of Pablo's men, as they were then called in Medellin, spoke English, did not know the market conditions and their relations with their northern neighbors were not very good. For example, a brief visit to one of the OSHA to Miami almost ended in arrest, but there was already so much merchandise that no army of mules could handle it, and that's when Leda and Young's transportation company came to the rescue. At this point, we will move away from the story of Carlos Leda and talk about how Rodriguez, Gacha and the Oshoa clan became full members of the Medellin cartel. Recall that by 1977, the three biggest bargains had formed a friendly alliance in Medellin. At that time, their organization was not yet called a cartel, but each of them in one way or another attracted the attention of the American authorities. About Pablo Escobar, you can watch our separate video, but about the others, we will now tell you. Let's start perhaps with the already mentioned above Rodriguez Gacha, nicknamed El Mexicano. Like Pablo Escobar, Gacha rose from the bottom. He was born into a poor family of peasants in the flower-growing village of Veraguas in the municipality of Pacho. Because of destitution, he had to drop out of school at age 12 and go to work clearing pastures. Since childhood, he had a strong character and never let himself be abused, but also showed many criminal talents. Also, a curious fact, he never had any documents, no passport, no military card, no driver's license. Formally, he simply did not exist. After growing up, Gacha went to Bogota to look for a better life and there he met Gilberto Molina, an emerald magnate who, having eliminated all competitors in a 10-year struggle, became the real ruler of the emerald mines. This is where young Gacha's talents came in handy. First, he became the Emerald King's assassin and then he became the head of his personal army. But to be under someone's boss, future El Mexicano did not want and in the early 70s drew attention to the promising niche of marijuana trade. However, he quickly realized that pot, a commodity extremely inconvenient for transportation and does not bring the desired profits due to existing competition, unlike the gaining popularity of cocaine. Gacha was also one of the first to realize the simple fact that buying coca paste from Peru and Bolivia was an unnecessary link. So he imported coca bushes to his municipality of Pacho, forgotten by God and the state. In the benign climate, the bushes yielded a crop three to four times a year and landless peasants from all over the area began flocking to Pacho. Gacha first appeared on law enforcement radars in 1976 it was around that time that he met the up-and-coming Pablo Escobar and the two developed the friendship based on mutual respect for each other's authority. Moreover, Gacha, unlike Pablo, never wanted to become a politician. All he wanted was to make a lot of money. As DEA agent Baruch Vega put it, El Mexicano was always a bigger target than Pablo because he was the one with most of the plantations and the largest armed wing of the cartel. By the end of the 70s, about 4,000 hectares in the rugged jungle were planted with coca bushes. By the end of the 90s, that figure would exceed 150,000 hectares. The nickname El Mexicano originated at the same time. Of all the members of the future Medellin cartel, it was Gacha who had the best attitude towards Mexicans. He had a huge collection of Mexican hats and he named his properties in the spirit of his favorite country, Nightclub Chihuahua, Bar Mintanampa, Rancho Hermosillo, etc. Like Escobar, Gacha was active in charity work in his hometown, building houses, helping with money, organizing concerts, but he was especially fond of soccer. In particular, he was one of the main shareholders of the Millonarios Club from Bogota, and many noted that it always had the most well-maintained and beautiful soccer fields. In general, Colombian soccer of that time was fully sponsored by drug traffickers, it was profitable for many reasons. First, they themselves liked it. Secondly, investing money in the ballet for the poor, drugs earned points of reputation among the common people. And thirdly, most importantly, through sports organizations is very easy to launder money. Rodriguez Gacha's economic empire was controlled by Rodriguez G and Compania, whose directors included El Mexicano himself, 
his wife Gladys, and their children, Douglas Gonzalo, Jose Fabian, and Usto David. From this firm, the drug trafficker controlled his agribusiness company in the Ganaderas, through which he supplied cattle to his farms in Cuernavaca, Mazatlan, Jalisco, Santa Rosa, Quinta La Chihuahua, and Rancho Hermosillo. He also financed the Chihuahua horse farm where his luxury horses were kept, chief among them Tupac Amaru, a stallion purchased for a million dollars from Osha Senior. The company's recognizable logo in the form of a silhouette of a horse's head adorned the entrance to his main house in Pacho called Casa Gacha, renowned for its luxury. The house was built by Japanese architects so as not to disturb the neighbors. Gacha loved live concerts but respected others so the walls were soundproof. The interior was amazingly luxurious. Bear skins, antique European dishes and gold, gold, lots of gold. According to legend, even the water faucets in Casa Gacha were made of pure gold and under the building was a system of money caches and secret tunnels. In Bogota, Gacha had eight fabulously expensive apartments and an entertainment center near the Guaymaro airport, where the finished cocaine was flown from. Next to the airport was its own hangar with several airplanes assigned its own strip. Thus, by 1982, Rodriguez Gacha had the highest commodity potential in the cartel, but he never claimed power. He was satisfied with being the leader in his remote area where he was the governor. This was not the case with the third member of the Medellin cartel, the Osha clan, perhaps the most mysterious member of this criminal group. Unlike Pablo Escobar and Rodriguez Gacha, the Osha brothers were born into a decent and respected family of cattle ranchers in Antioquia. Their great-grandfathers received state honors for opening the first horse fair and the first veterinary academy in the region, and in general, the Osha family name was associated with horse breeding. Griselda Blanco, for example, hated them for a reason. Having grown up in the slums of the city, she looked at the beautiful Osha house on the hills with envy from childhood, although it should be noted that their position and status in Medellin at that time did not mean super rich. Rather, they were simply wealthier than most of the other residents who thought about where to find a piece of bread. Jorge, the middle of three sons of Fabio Osha, Restrepo, and Margot Vasquez, was born two months earlier than Escobar and had known him since childhood. Osha father, a cartoonishly fat man, was known as the best horse trainer in the province and had bred a new and refined breed. In the mid-60s, Fabio opened a family restaurant called Margaritas the same name as their family hacienda in Antioquia. Everyone, adults and children alike, worked hard to keep it going. Jorge himself and his brothers, the middle one Juan David and the youngest Fabio as well as his sisters would be at the stove or washing dishes as soon as they got home from school until dawn. Lawyers and newspapermen often noted Jorge's allegedly difficult childhood. It was said that he dragged his family into cocaine smuggling because he felt sorry for his mother and sisters who bent their backs from dawn to dusk. But in fact, it is still unknown how exactly a decent and respectable family got involved in the drug trade. He rarely weighed less than 90 kilograms and, like everyone else in the family, did not resemble a criminal at all. An exemplary family man, quiet and gentle in his manner. Occasionally, he allowed himself a glass of dry white wine. He didn't even smoke tobacco, let alone drugs. However, he had a real entrepreneurial streak. He considered the American addition to cocaine to be a vice, but quite harmless. Let those who can afford it indulge, and he, Jorge Osha, will prey on human weaknesses. In the mid-70s, he began to visit Texas on business and observe the market. Osha then traveled to Miami as a specialist in the import-export of horses. He was making contacts among local Colombians to market cocaine on the east coast of America. It is still unknown what role the father of the family played in all this. According to one version, he was the main not only in his clan but also in the entire Medellin cartel and in general was the only one whom Pablo Escobar called his patron. According to another, he simply took part in some operations and therefore lived his life quietly, dealing with horses, and never once was brought to justice, trying to distance himself from his sons who chose a vicious path. In 1977, in sunny Miami, Jorge Osha showed a real provincial carelessness. He boasted that he brought into the States 100 kilograms of cocaine. 
It was probably a one-off because the year before, one of his relatives had been arrested at the border with a tiny shipment of one and a half kilograms, which meant that they, like everyone else back then, had been transported by mules. This interloper turned out to be a DEA informant of which there were many in Miami at the time. On October the 12th of that year, Jorge handed this man a suitcase with 27 kilos of cocaine and asked him to take the drugs to Miami. The DEA then arrested nine Colombians, among them Jorge Osha's sister and brother-in-law. Jorge himself was the only one who managed to escape. When he saw the police, he jumped on the motorcycle and drove away. Miraculously avoiding arrest, Jorge himself left Miami and never returned. That year, Pablo Escobar, along with his cousin Gustavo Gaviria, was already overseeing the collection of coca paste in Ecuador from Bolivia and Peru and its processing in Colombia. Escobar and Osha, as the largest and most ambitious businessmen, joined forces to increase production capacity. They also ran laboratories and sold cocaine to distributors who controlled its marketing in the United States, where profits were six times higher than from sales in Colombia. They soon monopolized the business in Florida, New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. Rodriguez Gacha then joined as a full member of the organization. When Carlos Leda, who bought the Bahamian island of Norman's Cay, joined the company, supplies increased. In the early 1980s, Escobar created a kind of central office of the Medellin cartel where small participants in the drug market to go to favorably sell their consignment. This decision was successful. It became simply unprofitable for other producers in the region to try to sell their goods themselves. It should be noted that those who did not show off and agreed to the terms of the Mediners were dealt with respectfully and peacefully, and there was always enough money for everyone. But those who tried to rebel against the cartel's expansion lost. And a monstrous feature of the Mediners was and is vindictiveness. Those who crossed the road were slaughtered to the last man, even if they could not be found at once. According to a scheme set up in the office, small sellers loaded their cocaine into Escobar and OSHA's large shipments and they made sure that no one bypassed the cartel. They insured small shipments and never sent a shipment away unless they had the proper amount of cocaine in stock to be replaced if the shipment was seized. DEA agents coined this insurance system the nickname Medellin Lloyds after a well-known banker of the time. Thus, by trading through the Medellin cartel, small businessmen risked virtually nothing. In addition, there were other characters in the cartel who had different responsibilities. The finances and business relations of the cartel were managed by Gustavo Gaviria and Roberto Escobar, Pablo's older brother, who had worked in accounting for many years. In addition, a power wing was formed with characters such as La Quica, Popeye, XX, El Angelito, El Chopo, El Osito, El Tato, and many others. They were all part of the cartel's security forces and armies of assassins through which the Medellinians established a balance of power to control and dominate the drug trade. They were all trained by Yair Klein, the owner of the PMC Hot Hahanit, a buddy of Carlos Leda, whom I mentioned earlier. It was reported that by the end of the 1980s, the cartel had more than 2,000 trained fighters. The most famous cartel enforcer these days is probably Popeye, who was nicknamed for his resemblance to the cartoon character. Like everyone else, he put forward his version of who oversaw the Medellin cartel. According to him, it was Jorge Osha. It was his instructions that Pablo Escobar obeyed. Popeye died only in 2020, having lived an eventful life. He managed to serve 23 years in prison for confessing to 257 contract murders and participation in the preparation of more than 3,000 murders and to write memoirs and to conduct a YouTube channel and even in our time managed to rattle back into prison after his release. He blackmailed important people like Jorge Osha who were previously associated with the cartel in the hope of getting money. It didn't work out and he died in custody in 2020. Less well known is a militant faction of the Medellin cartel called Los Priscos, led by the Prisco brothers Armando, Alberto, Enias El Negro, Jose Rodolfo, and David Ricardo. In 1980, David Prisco, also known as Chino, was arrested and convicted of carjacking. After his release, he was recruited into the Medellin cartel at the behest of Escobar. In its heyday, the group consisted of about 100 professional fighters. 
David Prisco, in the spirit of all Medellinians, was popular with the ordinary people of his Aranjuez neighborhood. He opened an account at the local supermarket for those who could not buy groceries and he also paid university tuition for local children. The brothers had a statue of St. Virgin del Carmen in their home and as eyewitnesses recount, they jointly offered a prayer to her before every business. And there were many cases. The Prisco family were involved in all major actions of the cartel and they are attributed to at least 200 contract political assassinations. Their names were published in the press after the assassination of the Minister of Justice and they were forced to leave Medellin. The criminal group was gradually dismantled from 1987 to 1991. In 1991, David Prisco was killed on the same day as his brother in two separate police operations in Medellin and Rio Negro. So by 1982, the Medellins were doing well. The cartel's production centers were in the south of the country, in the eastern plains and in the provinces of Meta and Caqueta. One of the largest full-cycle cocaine production and processing centers in the world, called Transquilandia, was operating here, producing several hundred kilograms a day. Not surprisingly, such a scale could not help but attract the attention of the Americans. To keep prices high, the Medellins put exactly that much product on the market so that its price would not drop, and they were making great profits. By 1982, a kilogram of cocaine in Medellin was being purchased for $8,000 and in Miami, it was being sold for $42,000. At the same time, the Americans began to shut down the Bahamian transportation route and Norman's K, under Leder's leadership, was no longer providing the necessary flow of traffic. The drug businessmen began looking for options and eventually found a way through Mexico. More on this in our video about the Guadalajara cartel. For the purposes of this story, let's just mention that there was so much cocaine that there was enough for everyone, both Colombians and Mexicans. Moreover, the opening of Mexican channels led to the market being oversaturated and the price per kilogram predictably fell, but later than the events described. This would lead to the appearance of a new drug on the streets of the United States, crack, which would not only become a real marginal symbol of the American ghetto, but would also lead the Medellin cartel to even more staggering profits. The price per kilogram would drop, but it would open a vast new market. By the way, interesting fact, in Colombia itself, cocaine was not very popular in the 80s. Firstly, as the price dropped, it remained expensive for the average Colombian, and secondly, Colombians switched to smoking cocaine paste, basuco, which had the effect of instant addiction and killing effect. Both Carlos Leda and Grisella Blanco became victims of Bazuco. One of the few deterrents to the Medellin narcos was the extradition law. A 1979 bilateral agreement between the US and Colombia had been ratified by both sides by 1981, but few people paid attention to it at the time. The news didn't even make the front pages of the newspapers and it certainly didn't concern Colombia at all. By 1982, however, the cocaine kings, with the growth of the organization, realized that the agreement concerned them directly. The main threat lurked in Article 8. Drug smugglers were subject to extradition to the US even if they had never left Colombia. All that was required was to prove that they posed a danger to the US, that is, that they were supplying drugs to the United States, and each of them had already been on the radar of the DEA, which however, did not fully understand how large the organization had grown and that it was a cohesive group and not a collection of local SARS who would be eliminated individually. Section 8 of the Extradition Act meant that US prosecutors could demand the extradition of anyone involved in drug trafficking. In the early 80s, after the battles on the streets of Miami that made history as the Cocaine Cowboy Wars, agents zealously began working in Colombia. The DEA realized that the big dealers feared American prisons like fire, so they preferred to operate from the safety of Colombia. The faces of drug kingpins like Carlos Lida gradually began to flash across the headlines and for years they had worked hard to build a screen of integrity. But it wasn't just their neighbors to the north who were watching the growing power of the cartel. In Colombia at that time, the terrorist left-wing group M19 was active. One of these areas of activity of which was the kidnapping of wealthy businessmen for ransom. 
On November 12, 1981, Marta Nieves Osha Vasquez, one of the Osha clans, was kidnapped while leaving the university. For her release, M19 demanded $12 million from the cartel. However, in response, the Osha brothers created a special armed unit called Muerte a Secuestadores, Death to the Kidnappers, which began exterminating the rebels. Guillermo Alvesio Ruiz, one of the leaders of M19 and his family, were among those killed by cartel fighters. In February 1982, the rebels released Marta Osha, effectively admitting defeat and made peace with the cartel. As a result of the war, M19 was forced out of the densely populated and wealthy province of Antioquia. This was the first, but by no means the last time the Medians would use paramilitary forces. Also in the future, the M19 would guard laboratories and carry out contract killings for the Medellin cartel. Also in 1981, the Colombian cocaine kings held a summit on the Caribbean coast near Barranquilla. This was the location of Jorge Osha's ranch, the Hacienda Veracruz. Further expansion of the cocaine business was on the agenda. The Osha clan had accumulated so much cocaine that they were looking for more and more ways to ship the drug abroad. Carlos Leda was the guest of honor at the meeting. His position on Norman's K was still strong, but he, like the others, realized that the capacity of the tiny island was no longer able to meet the increased demand in the American market. The dealers lacked airplanes, pilots, and most importantly, new smuggling routes. At Veracruz, the young drug kingpins solidified mutually beneficial ties and agreed through a mutual friend, Juan Mata Ballesteros, to begin the cooperation with the Mexicans we mentioned earlier. At the meeting, Jorge Osha also presented his own plans for organizing new routes and markets. In 1980, he had installed a long-range radio navigation system in Akandi, in northwestern Colombia, near the border with Panama. Thanks to this system, all kinds of flights were possible from the airstrip at Hacienda Veracruz. Being more than a kilometer and a half long, the runway was even suitable for large cargo planes. They discussed joint shipments of cargo, dividing up duties to maximize control of the drug network. The cartel grew by leaps and bounds, but it would not become a truly international organization until a few years later, when the cooperation with Escobar, Gacha and Osha would become unprecedented and the Mexican godfather Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo would fully join the business. In some ways even untied their hands, they had to think less about transportation and more about their own security. After all, the consolidation of this alliance within the country was accompanied by endless bloodshed. Medellin's police were powerless to stop the violence and killings. In 1982, the city became the fiefdom of the Cocaine Kings. Police and politicians took bribes and kept their mouths shut. Otherwise, death awaited them. The Plata Oplomo law worked much better than the extradition treaty. Old school smugglers had no place in the new system. With few exceptions, they peacefully gave up their positions. They lacked the wit and will to compete with the younger tribe. Most of them retired and the rest got used to a subordinate position under children and nephews. A handful of recalcitrant ones were forced to give away or simply removed from the road. A new era of the drug trade had dawned. Instead of loners, it was the pack. However, the city was teeming with suspicious individuals who were siphoning money left and right, so the daily spending of cocaine kings in the early 80s was not particularly conspicuous. Money was flowing into the city and they were spending it in a race. At first, it was quite difficult to distinguish drug kings from other idle rich people. Pablo Escobar loved auto racing and would fill the whole team with full equipment and cars at city competitions. Rodriguez Gacha became the unofficial patron and main employer of the native Pacho. The Oshoa clan continued the old business of breeding pedigree horses and bulls, but on an unprecedented scale. Osha horses were admired by connoisseurs from all over the world and even starred in European advertisements. The Oshas literally bought the entire niche of bullfighting popular entertainment in Colombia. The passions burning in this business were even referred to in the press as the Medellin Bullfighting Cartel. Osha physically destroyed all competitors, peaceful ranchers of bull breeding ranches became monopolists. There is one criminal case connected with fighting bulls from Spain thanks to which Jorge manages to return to Colombia, but we will tell you about that later. Carlos Leda, B. 
built a hotel in Armenia called La Posada Alemana. It had 24 luxurious rooms in Swiss style, a restaurant, a conference center, a nightclub with an observation deck, a mini zoo with lions and a wine cellar with a collection of fine drinks from all over the world. In front of the hotel was a monument to a naked John Lennon and touching him was considered a good omen among smugglers. Later bought up residential houses, buildings of state institutions and private firms in his native Armenia, which led to increased prices in land plots. He was often seen walking around in a knight's helmet and boots and his hand was often raised in Nazi salute. Later also became interested in publishing. He had his own newspaper with a huge circulation called Quindiro Libre. It was printed in green ink and proclaimed a marijuana civilization with a little bit of Nazism. Pablo Escobar, by the way, was not very fond of Lida because of his now obvious addiction to smoking bazooka. Plus, Lida was talking nonsense at every turn, then shouted fascist slogans, then boasted that he had donated a lot of money to the Liberal Party to support a presidential candidate. In this way, he publicly linked his name and the names of his fellow smugglers to the Colombian political system, which is why he made the headlines often. Of course, the cartel sought to influence the upper echelons of power, but only later bragged about it, attracting attention. Escobar called him Bocon, which means big mouth, but his connections and contacts were still important to the organization. Later, of course, behaved unwisely, but Escobar himself surpassed everyone and everything. It was not for nothing that he became the formal leader of the entire organization in the eyes of the public. In the 1982 elections, Escobar made an incredibly brazen act in the style of brotherhood rushes to power. He officially passed to the Colombian Congress from the district of Envigado as an understudy. When the main representative from Envigado, Jairo Ortega, was ill or absent, Escobar filled in. The richest drug trafficker became a congressman. Escobar and Ortega supported Senator Alberto Santafemio Botero, one of the pillars of the Liberal Party who wielded enormous power and influence. Santo Femio, a favorite politician of the cocaine cartel, became a symbol of the corruption of the Colombian political system. Turbe Ayala's presidential term was approaching its final stage, as 1982 was to be an election year and the extradition law was keeping drug traffickers busy, preventing them from turning out in full force. At one of the meetings, Rodriguez Gacha made it clear that his contacts in the opposition party had good news. Conservative party candidate Belisario Betanco had personally confirmed to one of his lawyers that if he won, he had no intention of extraditing Colombian citizens to the United States. Escobar, however, had garters in the other party and was betting on the liberals. Carlos Leda in his book tells us they fought with all the forces of the cartel to cancel the extradition. This episode is curious from the point of view of the teamwork of each member of the criminal organization. Pablo won a seat in Congress as Ortega's deputy and began supporting the campaign of candidate Lopez. As hard as it is to understand today, we experienced criminals did not fully understand the game of the political leaders. They had just approved in Congress a treaty that could expel us from our homeland. But at the same time, they wanted our support in money and votes. Pablo arranged a meeting with candidate Lopez. He agreed on the condition that the meeting be held in privacy in a room at the Intercontinental Hotel. The day before, Pablo Escobar summoned us to his office where six other bosses arrived. Jorge Luis Osha, Gustavo Gaviria, Pablo Correa, Alonso Cardenas, Rodrigo Murillo and El Mexicano. He first suggested that they each donate $100,000. Then Lopez arrived and confidently stated that for the moment, the extradition treaty would remain under study, and he did not believe it would be enforced anytime soon. Pablo tactfully mentioned the donation we were going to give him and said the support would continue. A couple of days later, I got a call from a frustrated Pablo Escobar. Come on, Carlos, I need your help. These bastard politicians have already betrayed us. Carlos, this can't go on. They don't know who they're messing with. They took $800,000 from us and now they're laughing at us. Do something, Carlos. It turned out that Lopez's campaign staff had assured the press that they would turn over the drug traffickers. 
Escobar instructed him to hold a press conference to detail his support for this politician from Bogota. At the press conference, Lira explained to reporters that decent and concerned businessmen had given presidential candidate Alfonso Lopez a donation equivalent to $800,000 to protest the extradition. The next day, it was in all the newspapers. In the Conservative Party, they were very pleased with the exposure of the meeting. Rodriguez Gacha said that for his part, along with other merchants from Pacho, he had donated nearly $1 million to the Conservatives. And, as Lida notes, it was Gacha's bid that made the difference. The long-awaited election day arrived, and candidate Belisario Betancur won by a wide margin. The new president said he would not visit Washington while he was president of the republic. For the Medellin cartel, this was a firm and reassuring signal that the extradition treaty would not be implemented during his administration. However, they rejoiced too early. For the Americans, meanwhile, were not slumbering. They started with the cartel's most notorious figure, Carlos Leda. His drug fumes did not do good. The island of Norman's Cay became a real brothel, and the owner himself suffered paranoia and delusions of grandeur. March 11, 1983, Leda founded the National Latin Movement, a new political party with an ultra-nationalist bias, and even with a threatening neo-Nazi spirit. The party considered its fundamental task to be the immediate termination of the US-Colombian extradition agreement. At this time, the US had already requested Colombia to extradite Leda, and a Supreme Court hearing was imminent and Norman Kay's island had to be abandoned and would be stormed a little later, and all of Carlos's accounts were frozen. Among all those to be extradited, the American ambassador called Leda the number one figure. He was the one in whom American law enforcement agencies were most interested. Leda was aware of the threat. He could be deported not only from Colombia, but from any country that had a bilateral extradition agreement with the United States. As early as 1982, Lida sent his men to the US State Department to probe the ground and he himself met with a US DEA agent in Colombia. Offered to sell Norman's K to the US for $5 million if they would close the case. You could use it as a military base, Lida said meaningfully at the time. He was, of course, turned down. Lida's insolence and shamelessness knew no bounds. In late July, he gave an interview for Bogota's Radio Caracol, saying that he had bought his islands in the Bahamas for more than a million dollars, and since they have faithfully served the most profitable Colombian enterprises. Without saying the word cocaine out loud, he admitted to running a friend's transportation business. His arrest and time in a US prison also had a simple explanation. He, leader in his youth, had been a leader among the Latinos in the neighborhood, a leader who defended his race, his principles, his Colombianism. Now he was going to be a senator, wanted to represent in the Senate the people subject to expulsion, represent the people of labor and the poorest of the poor. It is alleged that I have entered a secret conspiracy to the detriment of the United States. I will say no more. I intend to damage them until the expulsion law is repealed. Moreover, later acquired a printing press and a staff of journalists who produced a proclamation newspaper of the National Latin Movement in which Carlos declared himself almost a messiah and offered to pay Colombia's national debt to the US and declared the drug trade a crusade against capitalism. But the crazy provocative bravado did not bear fruit. On September 2, 1983, the Supreme Court decided the case in favor of the United States, finding later extraditable. A warrant for his arrest was signed in Colombia, but Carlos got wind of it in time and fled. Nevertheless, after approving the order for Leda's extradition, the new Minister of Justice, Lara Bonilla, who would yet play his strategic role in the story, passed it to the President Betanque for his signature. Then a major disaster befell El Mexicano. I've already mentioned the largest enterprise called Tranquilandia. It was deep in the jungle, and after openly supporting Betancur on the campaign trail, Gacha became a real hero and never attracted too much DEA attention, so no one would have ever found it if not for the ether needed to produce pure cocaine hydrochloride and a bunch of meticulous Americans. On February 9, 1984, the entire cartel gathered at a disco club in the mountains above Medellin. 
one of the main distributors from Miami who belonged to the Osha network, was celebrating the birth of a son. The godfather was Jorge Osha himself. The festivities went on for a week and all the while the cartel leaders were discussing pressing problems. As always, they were concerned about expanding their markets and they wanted to increase the number of routes and pilots in the ever-changing conditions. Their joint compound called Tranquilandia had already been operating in the jungle for six months and now is producing up to 4,000 kilograms of the drug a month. Many tons of cocaine had accumulated in the forests and the new complex required an uninterrupted supply and absorbed tons and tons of raw materials and the most important of which is ether. Ether is needed in the last stage of the long chemical process of cocaine production. To obtain an inhalable cocaine powder, the cocaine base obtained from cocaine paste is dissolved in ether with the addition of hydrochloric acid and acetone. The resulting mass is then filtered, dried and cocaine hydrochloride, a white powder regularly consumed by 5 million Americans in 1984, is obtained. 17 litres of ether are required to produce 1 kilogram of cocaine. Ether was not produced in Colombia, at least not in the quantities the traffickers needed, so they ordered it from abroad. After learning this simple fact, the Americans began to monitor the flow of ether imported into Colombia, and they realized that a ban on the importation of ether would hit the producers very hard. So they went to a local legal ether buyer who was buying twice as much ether as was legally used in all of Colombia in a year and fitted two barrels from the shipment with radio signaling devices the size of a pack of cigarettes, along with a powerful power supply designed to last a long time. A double bottom separated this entire structure from the airwaves. The first signal came from New Orleans, whence the barrels travelled to the vicinity of Barranquilla, directly to the famous Hacienda Veracruz, located in the vast domain of the Osha clan. After a while, the signal left Veracruz and was airlifted by airplane to somewhere to the south, and the next signal came from the impenetrable jungle in eastern Colombia. That was the destination. A 42-man extraction team went on the operation. They managed to take the narcos by surprise. No resistance was offered to them. Further passage revealed more and more of the Medellin cartel's activities. Not just the main laboratory was found, but a real factory with a full cycle of cocaine production. It fed and clothed about 100 people. There were generators, showers, washers and dryers. Not far from the strip, the police counted 305 drums of acetone, 363 of ether, 482 canisters of red gasoline, 133 canisters of jet fuel. In short, a huge stockpile of raw materials. It soon became clear what they were for. According to a flight log abandoned by the runway between December 1983 and February 1984, this makeshift airport received 15,539 tons of cocaine paste and base. And then the cocaine was discovered. Two tons of cocaine in various aggregate states. Soon journalists arrived and Colombian television broadcast the military and a good half of the country's correspondents inspecting the largest cocaine shipment in history. So much of the drug none of them had ever seen before. That's when the name of the camp, Tranquilandia, was leaked. Next to it was Cocalandia, and even Cocalandia too, which was under construction. Each of the camps probably belonged to different bosses. A guerrilla camp belonging to the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC, was also discovered. Apparently, the guerrillas were guarding cocaine production. In half a month, 13.8 tonnes of cocaine turned to smoke, and with them 14 laboratories and camps, 7 airplanes and 11,800 barrels of ether and other chemicals. Colombian authorities estimated that in two years, these laboratories had generated $12 billion in net income for the cocaine lords. The destroyed camps, along with the burned cocaine, generated a loss 10 times less. After the raid, the DEA and Colombian authorities realized that the Medellin cartel was no longer collecting shipments off the books from small home labs. The existence of Tranquilandia posed somewhat of a challenge to the government. If it's possible to build one factory, it's not going to take the rest. Maybe there were dozens or hundreds of them already. What's more, the facts pointed to the fact that all of it belonged to the Medellins. 
The airstrip at Rancho Veracruz led directly to the Osha clan, but the biggest revelation was Rodriguez Gacha's involvement in the venture. He turned out to be a full co-owner of the laboratories found in the jungle. This was indicated by a crashed airplane found on one of the landing strips in the forest. The owner of the plane was Usto Pasta Rodriguez Gacha, El Mexicano's own brother. The next signal came from the town of Leticia, where a rumor was circulating that Rodriguez Gacha had gone completely bankrupt because of the Tranquilandia raid. It turns out that as early as mid-December 1983, he had begun moving paste and cocaine base from Peru to Tranquilandia and had invested enormous sums of money in laboratories. Rodriguez Gacha's financial collapse clearly confirmed that he was a partner in the Medellin cartel. This is how the entire top of the criminal organization came to the attention of law enforcement. On the eve of the raid, the price of a kilogram of cocaine in Miami for bulk purchases was $14,000. After the raid, it jumped instantly, the first time in three years that there was a cocaine shortage, and the drug warriors were upbeat. The raid had done the cartel undeniable damage. But it does not end there. Lara Bonilla, the Minister of Justice, persistently attacks the aspiring Congressman Escobar in the political field, and he responds. So far, within reason too, the result of their fierce debate in the legal field was the departure of Pablo from the world of big politics in early 1984. It was the beginning of the end. First Tranquilandia and the final withdrawal of the entire Medellin cartel, then the revocation of Pablo's parliamentary immunity, Carlos Leader's constant exposure in the press and his almost open confession to cocaine trafficking. The beautiful screen that the Medellinians had spent so long building had been pulled back, exposing their bestial nature. It wasn't long before the bloodshed on the streets of Colombia began. On April 30, Lara Bonilla was murdered in his car on his way home. Several hitmen were involved in the crime, of which only one survived. The chain of hiring these hitmen is so long that it's not far-fetched to investigate and catch the culprits. So, both Lita and Osha were suspected. But in the end, it was likely an impulsive decision by Pablo Escobar, frustrated by his failure in big politics, who plugged in a chain of numerous gunmen in the service of the cartel. The war of bargains and politicians began that night. April 30, 1984. President Belisario Betancourt ordered a ruthless crackdown on both the bosses of the Medellin cartel and their enemies, the Cali cartel. Immediately, the decision to invoke the extradition treaty was made public. That same night, the criminals fled Colombia and arrived in Panama to Carlos Leda and their accomplice, Panama's shadowy leader, Manuel Noriega, who had been directly involved in their dealings since 1982, providing a staging point for transportation. Noriega took the exiles under his wing. He provided the cartel leaders with bodyguards and gave them useful advice. Osha rented a house near the Marriott Hotel. Escobar lived at the Valley and Bambito Hotels or at the Celebration Tavern. Escobar's hideout alone cost $1 million. That money went into Noriega's pocket. Under Noriega's patronage, the cartel conducted a double with a long-range aim game to restore its former power. On the one hand, the businessman launched a huge laboratory in the Darien jungles of Panama and intended to set up similar ones in Nicaragua. Still, they were all eager to make peace with the Colombian government in the hope that the old days would be forgotten and their sins forgiven. The Medellinians sent a long six-page letter to Belisario Betancourt through an intermediary. They called this outstanding message a unilateral declaration, emphasized the honesty and frankness of their position, and asked the president to consider the possibility of their reunification with Colombian society. In the first part, the authors summarized the history of drug trafficking in Colombia. It asserted that our organizations today control between 70 and 80 percent of the total amount of cocaine produced in the country and generate about $2 billion in annual revenues. Next came the assurance that the organizations we present were neither directly nor indirectly responsible for the murder of Lara Bonilla. Moreover, the businessmen disassociated themselves from politics. It was not in their plans to change the existing democratic and republican system in Colombia. The second part of the memorandum offered the government a deal. 
For their part, the cocaine kings collectively pledged to hand over to the state all secret airfields and laboratories to dissolve the cartel, to let their money circulate in Colombia, to help plant crops instead of coca and marijuana, and to cooperate with the government in campaigns to eradicate drug addiction and treat addicts in the country. In return, the businessmen wanted Beckenter to lift the state of siege that had been imposed after Bonilla's assassination and agree not to extradite to the US criminals who had broken the law before that landmark letter. In other words, the cartel demanded amnesty. Drug traffickers were receiving $2 billion a year and storing it outside the country. The smugglers' unpunished return meant an incredible amount of money would come back into the Colombian economy. The country was offered a colossal bribe. The cartel members received no response from Betancur or anyone else and continued to hide in Panama, gradually losing their millions. On June 15, 1984, customs intercepted 1.2 tons of cocaine packed in boxes labeled perfume at the Miami airport. The perfume was in the refrigerated chambers of a cargo plane of a Panamanian airline that rents out airplanes. A week later, Panamanian agents seized 6,159 tanks of ether in the Panama Canal Zone. Noriega was also playing a double game. Virtually emperors at home, in Panama, the Medellinians found themselves defenseless, accompanied by misfortunes and high-profile scandals. It was becoming obvious that the cartel would have to get out of Panama. Neither Escobar nor Osha felt at ease outside Colombia. Both knew that ultimately, the safest place would be at home where they could always buy the patronage of the powerful and hire assassins to keep their enemies in fear. But Betanka was not about to relent. He appointed another drug mafia fighter, Enrico Pereiro Gonzalez, to replace Lara Bonilla as Minister of Justice. Pereiro was inflexible, like Lara Bonilla, but unlike the late minister, he could now count on Betanka's support. By late summer, the US had requested the extradition of more than 60 Colombian defendants in drug smuggling cases. Finally, on August 14, Bogota Superior Judge Manuel Castro Gil filed preliminary charges against 14 suspects in the murder of Lara Bonilla and among them the so-called masterminds of the crime, Pablo Escobar, the three Osha brothers and Gonzalo Rodriguez Gacha. Later was of value to the authorities. Unlike Escobar, Osha and Rodriguez Gacha, who were hiding in Panama, later returned to Colombia and hung out with the guerrillas in the forest, becoming the main person in charge of the laboratories and the smooth production of the goods. On him alone, Bitanka signed the order for his extradition to the States, and Lida no longer had the right to appeal. Had Carlos been arrested, he could have been safely put on an airplane and sent to the United States without any red tape. In February 1985, Leader was interviewed by Spanish television in one of his jungle hideouts. Unshaven, scraggly and dressed in stained pants and black sleeveless shirt, he told reporters that he intended to create a 500,000 strong army to defend national independence, that the problem of extraditing criminals to the states had grown into a problem of national liberation and that Lara Bonilla had been shot by the people themselves before the minister had time with imperialists' help to send many, many Colombians to trial in the United States. Leda considered himself the symbol of all fighters against imperialism and claimed that in this struggle, the end justifies the means. Meanwhile, by the end of 1984, the Medellin cartel had regained some of its former power and strength. Things had indeed calmed down and they were able to return to their homeland. Pablo Escobar and Gonzalo Rodriguez Gacha were quietly busy rebuilding their network of producers and distributors. Lida was in the jungle, but as for Jorge Osha, he had not been heard of since May. His brothers were in charge of networks in Colombia, but Jorge seemed to have disappeared after an extremely confusing and complicated incident with a smuggler, informant Barry Seal, whose testimony and photos removed from Jorge the image of a model horse breeder from Antioquia, and even more, Seal extracted evidence of the connection between the cartels and the Nicaraguan Contras, who in turn were bitter enemies of President Reagan, and he began to move if only somewhere slipped communists. Barry Seal would be killed by a gunshot to the head in 1986. Around July or early August, Osha emigrated to Spain, with which he had long-standing ties 
both through his horse breeding business and the cartel. He showed up in Madrid under the name Moises Moreno Miranda with a slightly altered appearance. Osho traveled the country with his wife and made an exceptionally respectable impression. But Colombians have always had bad luck abroad, and especially Jorge. Soon after his arrival, Osho's wife began making large dollar deposits in local banks. In one of the most fashionable suburbs of Madrid, Osho bought a house of 750 square meters with a swimming pool, tennis court, warehouse and disco. In the garage were four Mercedes cars. Osho enrolled his five-year-old son in a bilingual American school. At the end of August, the special prosecutor of Spain, who was to prevent and eradicate drug trafficking through secret channels, received information that Moreno Miranda is not who he claims to be. They investigated and soon realized that Moreno Miranda is a smuggler who wants to settle in Spain. By September 25th, the police found out his real name and overheard five phone calls. Osha called Colombia, London, Panama and Belgium. Police informed the DEA resident in Madrid and he telegraphed to Washington. The Justice Department prepared a request for Osha's extradition in connection with the Nicaraguan case. The request was sent to the US Embassy in Madrid and October 17, the ambassador gave a copy of the documents to the Spanish Foreign Ministry. The US demanded Osha's arrest. Spanish police officers followed Osha for months. The scope of his activities was frighteningly large. In November, it became known that Osha was going to buy more than 4,000 hectares of land in southern Spain. Police feared that he would use the ranch to turn Spain into an international cocaine distribution center. On November 15, 1984, Spanish police arrested Osha and his wife and froze all their bank accounts. DEA agents saw to it that Osha's son was taken out of an American school. To the Reagan administration, the arrest of Jorge Osha seemed like a gift of fate. Not four months had passed since the US government named Osha and other members of the Medellin cartel as criminal partners of the Sandinista government of Nicaragua. Now presented an excellent opportunity to get Osha into the United States for trial. The Spanish were eager to meet him. Though they had never dealt with international drug trafficking, they were tired of all kinds of terrorism and ideological extremism and Osha's ties to the Marxist government of Nicaragua had an understandable political coloration in their eyes. The United States also outlined to the Spanish Osha's ties to Tranquilandia, which was guarded by the M19 guerrillas who were also communists. It all, cocaine, terrorism, Marxism, tied together for the Spanish, a triple nightmare of the free world. Spain announced that Osha was detained under special anti-terrorist laws and this entailed a review of the charges. Shortly after Osha's arrest and imprisonment in Madrid, the United States formally requested his extradition on charges in the Nicaraguan case. And a few days later, Colombia requested Osha be extradited to it on charges of forgery of a document, namely a license to import 128 Spanish bulls to Cartagena in 1981. In other words, Osha was again accused of smuggling. At first, the United States had the best chance of getting Osha. Drug smuggling is bigger than bull smuggling and the US demanded Osha's extradition before Colombia did. The Spanish government clearly favored the US. Osha's defender had to either negate these advantages or outmaneuver the enemy in some other way. Not six months later, Colombia made a second request for Osha's extradition. This time, the request came from Medellin. Fellow countrymen wanted to convict him for the same Nicaraguan operation, based on which Osha had already been prosecuted in Miami. What happened was that Jorge Osha's crony found access to court records in Miami, photocopied the Nicaraguan charges and sent them to the Medellin District Court. The result was one US request on one side of the scale and two Colombian requests on the other. Osha was accused by the homeland with one of the charges being completely identical to the one in Miami. In addition, government prosecutors had seriously miscalculated by lumping terrorism, communism and drugs together. And the defense did not fail to take advantage of this. Many Spaniards considered their own Spanish police and certainly Reagan's DEA to be ardent anti-communists who would attribute anything to the Sandinistas, even drug trafficking, just to discredit them. And Osha's lawyers quickly realized that the political sympathies of the jury could be exploited. They condemned Reagan for launching a dirty war against Nicaragua 
and portrayed their client as a pawn in a dishonorable political game. However, the prosecutors also engaged in very small tricks. One day, the country was abuzz with the news that Osha's friends had made a daring attempt to steal him out of prison by dragging him aboard a helicopter. A couple of days later, some police sources told the Spanish news agency that Osha had tried to bribe police investigators. In this story, Osha was portrayed as the viceroy of the world cocaine business, the second man after Escobar, which once again convinces us that who was really the head of the Medellin cartel is not known. Osha's case was heard in the criminal chamber of the National Court in Spain. The court studied the materials presented for almost nine months. Osha pleaded guilty to illegally importing bulls into Colombia, but categorically denied his involvement in drug smuggling and said that on charges of drug trafficking would not sit in the dock of Colombia or in the United States. Osha's defense lawyers persistently emphasized the political background of the charges and tried to discredit the US lawsuit. They argued that the charge was ridiculous because it was based on a testimony of Barry Seal, a notorious criminal and liar. In fact, Seal was the prosecution's main and only witness. The defense, however, had to admit the testimony of two other DEA agents associated with Barry Seal. They merely recounted Seal's testimony, but under Spanish law, secondhand testimony is legally binding. Thus, the prosecution now had the testimony of three witnesses one of whom was the perpetrator. Osha's extradition hearing before the Spanish National Court was scheduled for September 17, 1985. During the trial, the Spaniards treated Osha like an arrested Basque separatist. He was considered a particularly dangerous criminal with particularly dangerous friends. There were probably good reasons for this. In the courtroom, the public was separated from the judges, defense attorneys and prosecutor by a meter-long wooden panel and a floor-to-ceiling glass bulletproof partition. This usually discouraged political activists from shooting or throwing grenades during court sessions. Three judges looked out over the courtroom from a wooden dais. The defendant sat in front of them on a low bench with his back to the glass that divided the room. On the day of the trial, the gallery was crowded with Colombians, including members of the Osha family. At first, there was noise and a vague discontent in the air, but as soon as the judges came out, the crowd quieted down. Osha, dressed in a dark suit, sat quietly between two policemen in berets. He had lost a great deal of weight and did not look bad. Neatly trimmed, he was supposed to be a young, successful Colombian businessman cattle breeder. The hearing lasted about three hours. After closing the session, the judges deliberated for a week, and on September 24, they decided. The US lawsuit was unanimously 3-0, to zero, dismissed because it was politically motivated. Osha was to go to Colombia and stand trial for importing the bulls. Osha's attorneys won by putting up an anti-imperialist bargaining chip, discrediting Seal and showing their eagerness to give their client to Colombia. But the prosecutors appealed, and unbelievable but true, on January 21, 1986, the court reconsidered its decision and agreed to extradite OSHA to the United States. This time, the strained relations between the US and the Nicaragua were no longer a legally valid obstacle to extradition. OSHA was charged with drug smuggling, which is not a political offense. The defense immediately appealed the court's decision, and already in Cartagena, where Jorge Osha returned, he was sentenced to 20 months in prison, releasing him on bail. In 1987, he would become one of the 20 richest people in the world, according to Forbes, with $3 billion honestly earned on thoroughbred horses and fighting bulls. Bail, however, was $11,500. The reunification of the Medellin cartel was the beginning of a wave of political terror directed at those who would not let the drug lords live in peace. The Medellinians formed a group called Los Extraditables, which threatened all politicians who didn't want extradition revoked. Car bombs, assassination of judges and police officers, random victims in the streets swept Colombia. Special among all the inhumane actions is the seizure of the Palace of Justice by M19 militants, the same ones who first kidnapped Martha Osha and then controlled the cocaine labs under Carlos Leda. They were handed $2 million for the attack from the cartel. However, Leda himself in his memoirs denies in every possible way the Medellin cartel's involvement in the takeover of the Palace of Justice. Here's what he says. 
regarding the many speculations regarding the involvement of Pablo Escobar and apparently the Medellin cartel in financing the takeover, I can assure you that these are false. Neither Pablo Escobar nor I ever knew in advance of M19's plans to storm the Palace of Justice. Furthermore, in my opinion, this type of guerrilla operation to storm and take over the facility does not require a large monetary outlay because armed guerrillas are not paid and are not contracted mercenaries. In the streets of Medellin, a war of all against all began. And when the police got involved, a real bloodbath began. Hear more about why and how the police became a target for drug traffickers in our video about Pablo Escobar at the link in the description. Violence in those years became part of everyday life for Medellinians. In 1985, there were 1,698 murders here, the highest per capita rate for a state that had a total of 11,000 murders in the same year, also far more than any other non-civil war country. But 1986 broke all the sad records. 3,500 murders, 10 every day. The leading cause of death for males between the age of 15 and 40 was murder. Of the 1,155 cases reported in the city in the first six months, 80.4% of the murders were committed with firearms. In 1987, Carlos Lida was finally caught in the jungle. In desperation, he even wrote a letter to George Bush asking for a deal. The hearings on his case lasted seven months and they were attended with great pleasure by George Young, who had a chance to get even with his former friend who dumped him some time after the beginning of their cooperation. According to Young himself, he testified against Carlos with the permission of Escobar. Allegedly, the latter himself called him in prison, having learned that Lita is ready to give up everyone with the guts. George kept talking, revealing more and more details of the creation of the Median cartel, those that he knew, of course. As Lita himself writes, it was the most agonizing event of his life when all the past years in detail came out for the public's amusement. In the end, Carlos Lita was found guilty on all counts of cocaine trafficking. Here's what he himself has to say about it. Of course I was 100% guilty on all charges of trafficking many tons of cocaine. I was a smuggler. I was an international trafficker who penetrated land and sea borders and US airspace transporting South American cocaine. It was my dangerous profession and as a member of the Medellin cartel, my mission and duty. I was a Colombian drug trafficker that the Drug Enforcement Administration had been pursuing for many years. Carlos Leda was sentenced to 135 years in prison and after a year in solitary confinement, his eyesight was severely impaired. But then he, like George, got his chance. The US invaded Panama, captured the treacherous Noriega and Carlos testified against him again allegedly with the consent of Pablo Escobar. According to this version, Carlos wrote him a letter asking him to testify against the Median cartel and its ties to Noriega, to which he received a favorable response and a promise that none of his family would be harmed. Escobar kept his promise and Lida had hope. For the deal, his sentence was reduced to 55 years, of which he served 33 years from call to call, most of it working in the prison cafeteria. In the summer of 2020, he got out and was deported to his second homeland, Germany, where he still lives. This year, he published a book about his life called The Life and Death of the Median Cartel. His famous hotel in Armenia, after his imprisonment for the next 19 years, turned into a huge open-air hangout for John Lennon fans. Nowadays, the territory of La Posada Alamena is turned into a family recreation park and the famous statue has disappeared. Well, we're going back to the 80s. Leader's arrest had no effect on the activities of his colleagues, except that Jorge Osha, after the Spanish ordeal for a while, went into the shadows, leaving the reins of power to his brothers. He managed to get out of court on bail, and from that moment on, it was as if he had never been involved in anything. In fact, the two most violent members of the cartel, Escobar and Rodriguez Gacha, remained. El Mexicano finally solidified himself as the Medellin cartel's minister of war, becoming Escobar's main ally and supporter during the war against the state. By 1989, he had a faction of thousands of armed men, 
at the center of which was an elite unit of 70 select killers involved in many bloody episodes, including the assassination of Luis Carlos Galán, a principled presidential candidate whom Gacha considered a personal enemy. Escalating violence led to the absolute climax, the 1989 airplane bombing. Escobar and Gacha assumed that an important political figure would be on board, but he changed his mind at the last moment and survived. The bombing killed 110 innocent people and the gruesome incident marked the beginning of the Escobar and Gacha bounty hunt. In late 1989, Rodriguez Gacha was contacted through an informant. Navagante, the closest man in Gacha's entourage, betrayed his master. He reported that Gacha, his son Freddy Gonzalo and several bodyguards were in Cartagena. When the police and DEA found out, they sent 30 men from the elite corps to the Air Force Command in Barranquilla. Orders were given to keep two police helicopters ready to fly out of the Santa Marta airport. Thus began the military operation with the telling name Apocalypse. On Thursday night, Gacha, who has realized he has been figured out, boards a boat with his son and five bodyguards and heads to El Tesoro farm between Covenas and Tolu, whereupon the authorities lose sight of him. But thanks to an informant, an aerial search of the area begins to find the boat. It is discovered at dawn, but there was a man in it who confessed that he left Gacha at the Tolu farm where the militants are traveling to rescue their master. Back there, the soldiers in helicopters did not notice any movement in the house, but only sees a parked pickup truck and fly in the other direction. At the same time, the pickup truck drives away. The gunfire starts. The fugitives rush in different directions and Gacha, climbing over a barbed wire fence, almost scalps himself. Then he saw his son being killed and at the same time, he was shot in the leg. The next bullet hit him in the head. The blow was so severe that they had to identify him by fingerprints. There is a version according to which Gacha, having seen his son killed, committed suicide by putting a grenade to his face. But this is no more than a legend. If he had done so, the grenade would have torn off his arm. At the funeral of Gacha came several thousand people from his native municipality of Pacho. But the national love did not prevent grateful villagers from looting his Hacienda Casa Gacha from which they took absolutely everything and even blew up swimming pools in search of hidden treasures. And in our time, this still strong building was bought by China to open one of the largest embassies in Latin America. The other looted hacienda of El Mexico, Cuernavaca, today houses a dog shelter. And the director of the shelter tells how after the fall of Gacha, groups of people dug through the neighborhood in search of millions buried in the ground, but no one ever found anything. After Gacha's death, Escobar became the main and, in fact, the only target of all intelligence agencies. And with his death in 1993, the Medellin cartel went into oblivion, leaving behind powerful drug distribution networks and a sea of blood forever going down in history as the originators of mass cocaine smuggling. It remains to be told what became of the Osha clan, which, as it were, always remains in the shadows. I already mentioned Fabio Osha Sr., the patriarch of the clan at the beginning. Either an unhappy father or a shadow ruler of the cartel, he lived a long and quiet life, never brought to trial and died in 2002 at the age of 88. In September 1990, Colombia's new president, Cesar Gaviria Trujillo, offered the cornered drug cartel leaders to surrender to police promising not to extradite them to the United States. In 1991, all three Osha brothers surrendered and after serving six years were released. Juan David and Jorge Luis settled in Medellin and were never prosecuted again, becoming respectable businessmen like their father. Juan David died in 2013 of a sudden heart attack, but Jorge Luis is still alive as of 2024. Even though he has a pending court case over testimony he gave while already in prison as a Popeye cartel fighter. But the younger brother Fabio, after leaving prison, did not give up hope of becoming a drug lord and began to cooperate with El Chapo and the Sinaloa cartel as a consultant in the share. He shared routes and methods of work, taking full part in the lives of Mexicans, but as was already the case with Cuban Alberto Falcone, Described in the video about the Guadalajara cartel, Mexicans always leak those who are not Mexicans, no matter how prominent a drug trafficker he is. 
In 2001, Fabio was caught with 41 other Mexicans in Miami during Operation Millennium, each of whom testified against him to mitigate their sentences. The younger Osha received a 30-year prison sentence, which he is still serving. In prison, he discovered a lot of talents. For example, he is working on developing energy from ocean waves and has written a 250-page popular science book that no one wants to publish yet. Fabio Osha's estimated release date is September 14, 2024, should he be approved for another parole application this summer. After the Medellin cartel was destroyed, the Cali cartel took its place in Colombia. But that's another topic for another video.